So, yeah, um, this talk basically deals with, as the title says, um, collecting malware, building up huge piles of malware, and then doing something useful with these huge piles of malware. So, um, brief introduction of myself. Uh, I'm Georg Wisierski. I'm a developer at the mwcollect.org community. Um, I'm a member of the Giraffe HoneyNet project, which, which is a subdivision of the global HoneyNet project dealing with the low interaction honeypot type of stuff. Uh, I'm an employee of MZSoft, this is a small uh, Austrian antivirus company, and I am a student of the RWTH Aachen in uh, Germany. So um, let's, let's first talk about uh, why we are going to do this um, and what is our interest in collecting malware. Um, the basic idea is we want to monitor the, the bad guys and, and fight them, and especially bad guys here is, is botnets and, and botnet herders. And we do this by, by collecting and acquiring the malware through different means like low interaction honeypots uh, like Nepenthes or Honeytrap, client side honeypots like P Honey C, which I'm going to introduce for the first time for the public today and uh, simple spam traps collecting email attachments like spam sync. Uh, we, we, we then uh, have all this malware and this doesn't help us much alone so we need to automatically analyze this malware. We're using s uh, some s standard sandboxes like the Anubis sandbox but there you could also use the CW sandbox or the normal sandbox. Uh, we have experimented with Halvar's VX class, who is, he is going to present on it, uh, I guess, uh, later today. Uh, and we, we also developed some custom hash functions for, for grouping different malware binaries into specimen groups called PE hash. Uh, after, after analyzing these binaries and having some information what these binaries actually do, we're uh, monitoring the, the botnets the malware connects to using some monitoring software and we, we inform abuse, abuse departments and the like. Uh, and all after doing all that monitoring stuff, uh, we, we, we correlate all data like link botnets to binaries and, and botnets to attacks and all the like and want to display it in a, in a usable way so because resolution is also very important, especially for the technically not so skilled. Um, having all these ideas, what we want to do, this is a, a picture of an actual a setup in the MW Collect Alliance. So um, we, we actually have the, the malware collection stuff here, putting it all into database where it's get fetched by the sandbox and some antivirus for having some nice signature names for, for these binaries. Um, which is again put into the database. From there, the botnet monitoring software gets the data from the database, again puts it into this, and then we have the web interface for displaying all this. So there's one central database and all these tools fetching data from it. <coughs> so the first step is the malware collection, and there are several tools to do this, and I'm going to briefly outline how they work. Uh, first of all, there's Nepenthes, a low interaction honeypot. Um, which, which works by emulating the, the known vulnerability. So for example, we have the LDAS exploit, there's some, some uh, public exploits for it, and we just look at the source of these exploits or the information about the vulnerabilities and write some, some um, module to emulate these vulnerabilities. Then uh, we, of course, are going to get uh, some exploit from the malware with a payload, like a shellcode. So we analyze the shellcode, and then just download the malware from the infecting host via HTTP, TFTP, whatever the malware uses to propagate. And then we, we just store it on the hard disk or submit it into the database or whatever. Um, and since this is uh, implemented in C++ using async IO, this is very performant so you can monitor your whole slash 16 subnet or whatever your own university or something owns with a single commodity hardware machine. So this, of course, uh, unused IP space here you're going to put into your honeypot. Um, yeah, it's, it's released under GPL. It's like out there for two years now and version 0.2.1 is going to, to be released soon with some, some improvements and main parts of the software are uh, written by Paul Becher and Markus Kata. And you can just download it for free on the internet. So this is the actual, the actual structure of this program. Uh, we have 
these these vulnerability modules here that uh, all feed the, the the payload of the exploits to the shellcode manager, uh, which uh, links glues these modules with the shellcode analyzation modules. I'm going to explain all of these modules later on. So there's signature-based and also emulation-based shellcode analysis. Uh, we, of course, may have to emulate a shell because uh, a lot of the malware uses the, the, the bind shell or connect back shell exploits just posted on, on millworm.com or something. So we have to emulate a Windows shell for these to propagate because they, they actually exploit a host and then connect to, to the bind shell used in the exploit and then issue commands and that's a way to propagate so they have no real propagation shell code. Um, and after analyzing this we, we get some, some kind of URL which is then fed to the download manager which is the glue between the shell code modules and the download modules and at the end of all this we have a binary we can, we can put on the local hard disk, automatically submit to some normal sandbox or whatever or just submit it to some, some central place via HTTPS. So vulnerability modules, um, yeah, how do they work? They, they real poorly uh, simulate the, the original vulnerability. Um, and most vulnerabilities just work in the way that, uh, or most exploits work in the way that you send n fixed strings called stages. Um, and then just expect some response, and, and this goes on for, I don't know, two or three times, and, and then you send your final payload with the, with the offset and uh, the actual shell code, and these, these pure simulations, which are sufficient to, to work with current malware, just send random junk uh, for all these stages they exploit, expect, uh, dismiss every, all these intermediate stages, the exploit just needs to set up the actual vulnerability trigger, and we just take into, the count, into account the last stage, which uh, includes the payload. Uh, and uh, then we either pass the whole payload to the shellcode analyzation modules or just uh, a fixed substring in, in these, these modules because there's the shellcode and that's what we're interested in. So here's, here's one code excerpt. So as you can see, this really all replay is just a half kilobyte. Um, we're just filling it up with random junk and sending this to the malware. And as they're using these, these public exploits, this isn't a problem, so we don't need more accurate emulation. So this is really simple. But we do know, need to sometimes adjust some fixed string somewhere so it detects the right target, like to distinguish whether this is a Windows XP or Windows 2000 host or something like that. But usually it's just as simple as sending random junk, some, some fixed size junk. And then, um, if you're lucky, we actually get the payload from the malware, um, and then we can, we can analyze the payload for, for the shellcode. And there's two modules. The first one is um, shellcode signature, which, which is, works like the common antivirus software today. It's got patterns for the, the usually occurring shellcodes, and then uh, in, these, in these patterns, these are PCRE patterns, um, it, it has certain parameters like which, which host to connect to a back or where, which port to bind the shell to uh, or for the simple decoder shell code parts, there's just a XOR queue or whatever. And since patterns are separated into uh, at, at once the, the, the decoder patterns and also the payload patterns, um, it is really simple to, to uh, we're using some like, I guess it's like 40 different shellcode patterns and with these you can analyze all shellcodes that are out there in malware today for propagation, so that's sufficient. Um, yeah, and then there's a shell emulation because as I've said, most malware today uses just some, some stock bind shell exploit, uh, which then this shell emulation just opens the port on the, the given bind shell port and uh, the malware then issues some, some uh, windows bash, yeah, I don't know, the, the batch commands um, like, like echo open blah blah into some file and then executes the stock windows FTP command line utility on this file and the shell emulation all interprets these commands and then builds us a nice URL to fetch the malware from, from these commands. Mm, and the other um, shellcode emulation module is based on libemu, which is also a development by the mwcollect.org project. It's a generic X86 uh, emulator, which can detect and analyze shellcodes. It's written in C, uh, also by um, Marcus and Paul. Uh, you can download it for free too, it's all GPL. 
And um, yeah, as you can see, we, we also can plot fancy graph with this library, so it's a bit more than just analyzing and detecting shellcodes. And this is, for example, from, from the link bot. So what this actually looks like, this is a, the, the control flow graph of the, the link bot shellcode. And as you can see here, we have some, some um, XOR decoder. We then have the usual locating of the, the kernel library and, and by, by hash lookup like the, the, uh, today's Windows shell codes work, we res resolve some library functions and then uh, uh, first open the socket here and then this here is the whole downloading and then here we have some execution of, of these functions where this is again uh, actually only a stop to locate a function which is then called by several sub functions in the shell code. And at the end, I guess it's here, we actually have downloaded the malware and then again call in here to finally execute some of these functions. Yeah, it's pretty small because the shell code is rather big. Uh, to finally execute the, the downloaded binary on the infected host. So uh, with, with this approach, we are able to generically detect arbitrary zero day shell codes, so to speak, uh, because it's just a full blown. Uh, CPU emulator and any shellcode that runs on the attacked CPU will also be detected by this one and we know what it does generically. And this is a new development because you know uh, in the past we, if there was a new shellcode, some, some users sent us a new shellcode, we had to analyze it manually in some debugger or disassembler, write a new pattern and this took time and, and this just works immediately because it's generically generic. And then after we build our nice URL from the shellcode, we're just going to download it because they usually use either HTTP or FTP. Some other uh, malware variants use TFTP or even RCP. I didn't know Windows had RCP until I saw some malware using it. Um, uh, and sometimes there are also so kind of proprietary uh, commands for transferring the malware. Because, for example, Agobot uh, introduced CSend and CReceive, which are rather simple because they just send the length of the binary and then the binary itself, and that's it. Or link bind and link connect back, which are really, really nasty because these shell codes actually generate a per session secret. So for each attack, they generate a new secret. Uh, and the secret is actually not just put into the shell code, but there's code generating the secret put into the shell code. And this then has to be transmitted on the we want to download the malware binary connection. And um, if the secret is not right, the, the, the bot just terminates the connection and uh, otherwise it works. So this, w this was actually a measurement against this kind of honeypots, low interaction honeypots. But as we could write patterns for this too, we could easily circumvent this. But it required some time of research to see what, why does it generate this junk in memory and why does it sometimes terminate connections and whatever till we figured out, okay, this is kind of a per session secret we have to transmit. Um, yeah, and also for HTTP and FTP, we, we couldn't, we were first used libcurl, which didn't work out all the time because we had to write RFC and compliant implementations of these two protocols because um, the Windows implementations of these protocols were also RFC and compliant. So if you use the FTP stock, FTP command line client, it allows you to do things um, the normal uh, FTP RFC doesn't allow you to do. And uh, the bots actually were just developed using these command line tools from Windows. And so I guess the bot authors never read any RFCs. So we had to, to write some, some broken implementations that are as broken as the Windows implementation so they would actually work with the malware. Um, so we again had to re-implement these protocols, which was yeah, a tedious work. Well, we had to do it. And that's about it. So um, as I've said before, there's some, some alliance, the MW Collect alliance, and this is a, yeah, you can get a picture of what is going on in the world for using the Pentest centers from this. So as you can see, um, even though client exploits are today said be the way to go, this is from yeah, this week, a picture. So there's still malware spreading using the traditional exploits Nepenthes can catch all over in the world. So red balloons are attacking hosts, and green balloons are sensors. Um, you can see there's, there's malware everywhere, basically. Um, yeah, that was a bit about Nepenthes, so let's have a look at some, some other kind of malware collection tools. Pihoni C is a, um, a, low, a client, low interaction client honeypot because nowadays, uh, most of you probably know MPEG or ISPEG. They're 
uh, our client side exploit toolkits and um, yeah it's it's a big trend because there are few uh, way few um, vulnerabilities like like decomals that lives are exploitly remotely without any setup uh, published anymore today and most vulnerabilities are in Internet Explorer or whatsoever. So um, Nupentis was cool like two years ago where everything spread through DCOM and nowadays we need to actually find the exploits so the attacking hosts aren't coming to us anymore, they're not knocking at our door and saying I want to attack you, but instead we have to spider the web and find a malicious website and this is what this software does. So. Um, it's not released yet because there's still some work in progress being done on it, and it's written in Python, mainly by Jose Nazario, who is working for our networks. Um, and we're col collaborating on this. So um, it spirals the web like a search engine, engine looking for attacking sites. And um, to find actually attacking sites, we, what we do is um, we, we deobfuscate all this JavaScript, which is often pretty much obfuscated, and uh, then again, just run the lib email shellcode detector on it. So, um, yeah, if there is an exploit in this JavaScript, there's going to be some variable holding the actual shellcode used in that exploit if it's not like a cross site domain, cross domain scripting vulnerability. And for these, there are static modules detecting these kinds of vulnerabilities similar to Nepenthes. And this way, we can, we can find uh, malicious websites. And as you know, there's already high interaction um, client-side honeypots. And this is an ideal pre-filter because you know, running each site on the web through a high interaction client-side honeypot takes like, I don't know, one, one minute per site or something. And using this, we can spider the web really fast. And suspicious URLs can be then forwarded to a high interaction client honeypot, speeding this up a whole lot. And uh, yeah, um, so uh, we, we want to, to make this even cooler by downloading the malware automatically from these sites instead of feeding them to a high interaction on like we do in Nepenthes right now because with LibEMU we already have the capa capability to see what is the shellcode actually doing and if we have this capability to see what it's doing, why not download the malware directly in the low interaction honeypot? And this would then be a real cool thing then because it's very fast and gets you all the malware. Um, so how does it work? We, we have a URL, we fetch the malware on all reference, reference resources. We deobfuscate the included JavaScript, uh, which, which yeah, is often like several nested eval commands for those of you who, who know JavaScript. Um, then we, we just run it through libemur or look for certain cross-domain scripting vulnerabilities like in the old ages of Internet Explorer and something like that. And this is actually from a recent, very recent Internet Explorer exploit uh, where it just has a shellcode, uh, which is a pull script, which has a shellcode, but then it, it writes a JavaScript file, which then calls just an unescape on the shellcode. So in the end, you will just have uh, the actual shellcode as a parameter to the function in JavaScript. And using SpiderMonkey, we can just look at all vari variables and parameters and then use libemu to, to see, okay, this one is a shellcode, this is what we are interested in. <coughs> Another way of finding malware besides uh, the, uh, the Honey Client is just a, a spam thing because, you know, if, like since at least since Stormworm and even before, a lot of malware is just spammed around and dump users click on attachments because, you know, it's a funny picture or something or dancing skeleton uh, and execute it and, uh, well, this is malware interested in too. So what we do is just uh, we set our own, uh, up our own mail server uh, propagate email addresses to this mail server all on the web, like on some forums or whatever. And then just, uh, well, this is like dark space for IPs. This is like dark space for mails. So um, we, we just consider all email coming to this mail server as malicious. And as a result of this, all executable attachments to this web server are malicious too. So this is the way we can simply, very simply collect these uh, kind of malware. And yeah, this is nothing to be released because there's no, no real software being developed. It's just setting up your mail server and scanning through all attachments. That's another thing we're doing. Um, and now we've got that huge pile of malware, uh, which was actually what we did f uh, in the first year. We just stacked up the malware and we're happy we had so much malware, but we want to put some use to all this malware we were collecting. So we're doing some malware analysis. 
Um, we're working together with, uh, with the folks from the TU Wien here in Vienna. Um, they developed the Anubis Sandbox, which is pretty simple. It's just like a kernel rootkit uh, running in a virtual machine. So you load that malware into the virtual machine. This kernel rootkit records all calls to APIs and therefore knows what the malware does. So uh, yeah, what you get in the end is a detailed report on what the malware does. So what we are especially interested in is like the here joins IRC network. And this is just the header of the whole page. So it goes like 20 or 30 pages along. And then we can see the detailed information where it's connecting to, um, which works for, at the moment, not so many IRC binaries, but it works at least for some. So this takes the burden of granular analysis away from us. Um, yeah, and then we got these reports and we wrote some parallel script for these reports and what we get in the end is just a huge database of botnets. So we have a binary here and here's the botnet. So this is actually a botnet command and control host. Here's the part, no server password. This is the channel with the channel key, the server nickname, username, and real name. And this goes on for, this is just like, I, I just attached to the screen where this analyzation script was running and then copied it. So as you see, for some binaries, there's also no botnet information, but it's just a whole lot of botnet samples we're seeing. And yeah, we just fetch it out of them. Mm. And yeah, well, that's about it for getting all the botnet information, which I, we are going to use later. And another problem uh, in malware analysis we were running into was um, polymorphic binaries. So for those of you who know the all Apple worm, uh, it's uh, polymorphic. So each attack yields to a new binary which in, with a new, unique MD5 sum. And that's pretty nasty because this is a screenshot from the web interface, um, which was just displaying the, the most recent binaries. And um, as you can see here, there's these all just hit our sensors once, and these were all apples, and these just pollute our database because you know it's pretty hard to work with the database, which which we're seeing like, okay, there's like uh, 100 new binaries today. Uh, what does this actually mean? Was there 100 new botnets created to you today in one single day, or was it just one polymorphic uh, binary attacking you once again? And uh, what we did is develop a custom hash function because there's a lot of, of nice algorithms to, to group malware binaries into specimens, for example, VX class. But these probably take like 10 minutes per binary. Again, this is taken from VX class, which is a great thing. But uh, we get at peak times 10 binaries per minute. And this is, uh, well, doesn't match by a factor of 100. So it's too slow by a factor of 100. And we need a way faster method to, to actually group binaries together into specimens. Um, and what we do is we look at the actual PE structure of these binaries and we develop a hash, we develop a hash function that just inspects the PE headers. And therefore, uh, polymorphic binaries always s s share the same basic PE characteristics. And this way, we can, we can identify them and group them together by this specific hash function, hash value in this case. So um, we, we hash the PE header, and, and um, yeah, we, we, we can group them by the hash value as if it was the MD5 value of the whole binary. So we can say, uh, this is one malware specimen. This is one malware signature name or whatever. And um, it's important to note that the, the result of this research is a hash function and not a message digit. So it's very trivial for an attacker to, to construct two binaries which entirely different content which share the same hash value because it's a hash function and not a message digit. This is a cryptographic uh, difference. So um, first, security by obscurity applies. So if, if we tell attackers how our hash function works, they can just uh, construct uh, collisions and therefore single convent our research. Um, and we must be very careful when publishing these hash values. So when we say we have a new malware specimen with this hash, this might be, uh, might have some consequences. So it's better to MD5 the actual uh, hash value again. So an attacker cannot reverse the hash function to the PE properties. Yeah, and, and this uh, hash Implementation was made by me, was my research, and uh, if there's some interest, uh, yeah, please. Just a small question, why don't you use MD5 in the first place for hashing? 
Uh, well, we actually do, but so for the web interface, we actually use MD5 hash because the hash function is very long and we compress it that way. But um, the actual hash function itself um, is, is very, uh, it's, I just wanted to say that it is easy to create collisions this way. So we must make a secret of our hash function to prevent collisions. Um, and yeah, what we first look at is, is um, the actual uh, subsystem or whatever, the stack size and uh, the imported libraries. These are global PE properties. And um, these are very specific sometimes. In other cases, stack and heap size is constant for certain compilers. So these are just some, some basic measurements. And the more interesting things we are looking at is the, the properties of the actual sections. So if you don't know PE file, PE files, so for those who don't even know that, PE files are the executable, it's an executable file from out of Windows. And like ELF is for Linux. And we're looking at data section and code section and the like. And um, we are actually only looking at the first three sections because otherwise this, the hash wouldn't have a constant length. Um, we look at the size of the sections in the executable, where it's going to be loaded in the memory. These are very different for each binary. Uh, we, we XOR the hash names. For some compilers, the ha uh, the, we, sorry, we, we XOR hash the names of the sections. For some compilers, these are static. For other malware specimens, these are dynamic with each instance. Uh, sorry, with, with, with each specimen, not with each instance. And what is very important, because we still had some collisions for, um, for different specimens, is we, we approximate the Kolmogorov of complexity, which is a theoretical measurement in computer science for, for the richness of, of information. So if, if you want, uh, want to say, uh, like, uh, 6As is way simpler in, in the richness of information terms than this random string, um, then you do, do this by comma of complexity. And to approximate this, because uh, from definition this cannot be generically computed, we approximate it by compressing the data and then just look at, at the, the ratio of the compression, uh, which is a, is a good approximate of the richness of the data, because if you have a lot of A's, one like four kilobytes of A's, you can compress it to a few bytes. And if you have four kilobytes of random data, you can't compress it at all, more or less. And this is our approximate of, of the richness of the data, um, which we scale down to an index between 0 and 7. And this way, we can, we can easily say, for example, um, this is code, or this is some uh, zero initialized data, or something like this. And the funny thing is, um, even if we have a metamorphic malware specimen, which, which transforms its code, each, each which is even worse to detect than polymorphic malware, the richness stays the same. Even if all instructions change, the richness more or less stays the, cha uh, stays the same. So this is a very good measurement for this. And um, the re results from real life showed us that this hash function we develop actually works because um, there's 33 distinct PE hash for all, L all apples we ever see. Uh, and for all these PE hashes and for these all APLs, we have exactly zero collisions with any other kind of malware. And three of these hashes were holding more than 99% of all APL, which correlates with three different all APL variants discovered by virus antivirus companies. And our guess is the remaining 30 hashes, which all were only holding one binary, were trans transfer errors. So that's like, um, 20,000 all April we've seen so far, and they all have the same hashes except for 30, where we are going, we're saying these are simple transfer errors because they have pretty unusual sizes and some are even, aren't even valid PE files. So this showed us this actually works, and what we have now is this, this nice grouping of, of binaries. So we, as you can see, we now have uh, those with more hits again, and we can group them together and, and take all, out all this all April and, and such, and so it actually works. And now that we, we have all uh, the stator, we have analyzed the malware and have got some botnet information and whatever, um, we want to, to do some botnet monitoring because most of today's DDoS still comes from, from botnets and um, so uh, we, we want to be seeing which botnet herder is attacking whom, or 
where are all these, these phishing mails coming from and all the like. This is mostly today coming all from botnets, so we, we do some botnet monitoring. And um, yeah, we have developed a tool, BotsnipD, for the German Federal Ministry of Information Security, I guess is the correct translation, so it's a BSI for the Germans here. And um, uh, it's also written entirely in C++ for performance using Asynchronous I.O. So as you can see, we like performant applications. Um, and the design goal for, from the BSI is that we monitor uh, 10,000 botnets on, uh, simultaneously on a single commodity hardware server. And um, this is uh, the approximate of so half of all botnets out there in the world. So their source is saying like there's 20,000 botnets in the world, which is, I guess, even a little bit more than there actually is. But there are these sources, and this is one of the biggest numbers we heard. And with these design goals, we can monitor all botnets in the world with two commodity servers. Um, and uh, actually, the software is also shared under the GPL, but not with everyone because we don't want to know. We w don't want the black, uh, black hats to have our software so they cannot block our monitoring software by looking at its source in case it has any de design flaws revealing its identity at monitoring software. But those who, who are like ISP or whoever has a reason to monitor botnets can approach us or the BSI and say, we want the software and they're going to share it under the GPL, so you even get the source with us. Um, here's, they actually allowed me, so this is kind of classified information. It's not really classified, but they, they want us to talk about it, but they allowed me to talk about it here, so that's pretty nice. And this is how it actually works. Um, this is the core daemon, which is again modularized. So you have the different client modules, because not all botnets are ISC anymore today, like there's a lot of HTTP botnets in Russia these days. and. Um, here in, in, in the States, there's still a lot of IRC botnets, and there's also a Wovenet client for monitoring the Stormwarm botnet. Storm warm botnet. Um, yeah, and these are all managed by the protocol manager, so there's an interface to our great Postgres database again, which, or we can also control this daemon by IRC itself. So uh, as soon as we have a new botnet in the database, we locate a new client from some protocol, and this then just runs and joins uh, the, the botnet and feeds all generated events back to the event manager, which again feeds the information um, into the database. And I guess I have a screenshot from that database uh, later on. And we also have some logging and the, the, the normal daemon functions in that daemon. Um, so yeah, this is how the software worked, and if you're interested in details or whatever, don't hesitate to approach me, but this is what I can officially, globally, publicly say about it. Um, and so what are we seeing right now? Because you know it's nice to talk about our theory and software, but it's also nice to talk about results, and what we're seeing is, um, first of all, um, starting in Russia these days and coming to other continents more and more is, um, the prevalence of HTTP botnets because ISC is nice, but um, you somehow limit yourself. For example, if you have a botnet of a fixed size, you have um, also that amount of connections to your server simultaneously. So if you have a 60,000 botnet, you have 60,000 simultaneous TCP connections running all the time, which means they are eating up your resources all the time. And an HTTP botnet, um, in an HTTP botnet, you are just setting up your web server and each bot pulls your command file like every 60 minutes, and that means you have 60,000 connections, but spread over 60 minutes and not being active all the time, which means on the one hand, um, you have less resources to maintain on the server, on the other hand, you have more traffic resources and a handshake for each connection and whatever. Um, and also, it's way easier to set up for the kiddies because they don't really have to, to root a server to set up their ISC server. They just have to own some, some web server. And um, if they own the web server, um, they can just set up the command file there and let the bots pull these URLs. So they can actually use some, some tripod or whatever um, account, hack it, and then put the command file there. Um, yeah. As I've said, it's not performant, but it's the way to go for kiddies. And the other thing is peer, to peer command and control, like seen in Stormworm. And I think it has already been talked to the death by some researchers, but just briefly introduce here. So um, they, they use the overnet peer-to-peer -peer network, which is usually used for file sharing. 
uh, frequently query the network for, for updates and um, so the, the advancement is you have no more single, uh, one single point of failure. So if you take, usually want to take down a botnet, you take down this command and control infrastructure, which is between one to 10 servers or something like that, and you're done. But with the peer-to-peer -peer approach, you just kind of take down all uh, overnet nodes in the world because there's millions. So um, yeah, these are hard to take down. Um, and Overnet, as a decision for peer-to-peer -peer protocol, is actually a good decision by the malware authors because it features DHT search, which is like nice for finding a central point in the network, so you don't have to float the whole network, but you just ask the network, okay, where is this information, and then you have a short single route in the network. So algorithmically, this is a nice idea to use Overnet and not like Nutella or what, what else. Um, on the other hand, big botnets could also profit from Gruntella because um, in the Gruntella case, you're flooding your commands through the whole network and each node passes your queries on. And the advance here is that if, if, you, you want, if you issue a new command, it gets floated through the whole network at once. And using Overnet, you, you just query through the network and all nodes query for the same, which means they are going to end up the, uh, on, I don't know, like 100 nodes in the Overnet network are going to be queried all the time because they know where this resource is. And so they're on the, the default route to your botnet resource, so to say. And in the Gruntella network, um, your commands just spread out. So for a real big botnet, even bigger than Spawnworm, which is actually not as big as media always says, um, there, this would be better. Um, however, if you have a single infected host behind firewalls or whatsoever, um, using peer-to-peer -peer as command control is very noisy because if you have uh, an infected node with an IRC network, there's one additional TCP connection and that's it. And if you have an infected node which is using peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, it's issuing new TCP or UDP connections all the time uh, and therefore probably putting up pretty much alerts that your file was. But again, botnets are usually targeting home users, so people don't bother. I mean, home users don't have firewalls anyway. And third new trend is uh, encryption of commands for RIC botnets. Because um, uh, some, some years ago, you would only have seen these kind of commands. So this is actually a screenshot from the, the, the database maintenance tool maintaining the, the botnet database. You would only see in these, these, I don't know if you can read it, it's like ADV scan, AS1, SMB, and so on, so this exploit and which range to scan, and that's it. So these are pretty easy to interpret. Mm, now they use some kind of encryption in some botnets, especially link botnet, link bot botnets, um, which, well, it's not a real encryption because it's just um, rotating some bits with, with the role instruction and using then some, some reverse custom base64 encoding. So it's not real encryption, but merely an obfuscation. But nevertheless, um, each botnet binary contains some custom constants for this obfuscation. So we can just say, okay, they, they do this and to, to obfuscate the commands and we can reverse it. But we have to look at each binary manually to figure out how, which contents for constants for rotation they are actually using. And this is again tedious work we wanted to avoid with doing our whole automatic approach. Yeah, and so this is kind of necessity. We are now looking into machine learning for automatically identifying what these commands do with some high interaction honeypots, but this is research we are thinking about to do in the future, so this is, isn't, isn't even ongoing research, and this is one of the, the current trends we were, we were looking at. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. Um, so we have some conclusion. First, it is feasible and possible to, to build a setup that collects malware, analyzes it, and monitors botnet without any human intervention from start to the end. So um, Herder compiles new binary, releases it, and we automatically join the botnet without any human intervention, and this is what we wanted to do. Um, and second, second conclusion is uh, building up that setup and maintaining it and all that kind of stuff is a shitload of work, so um, it's easy to, to, make, to, to put all these software together in a way so it doesn't work at all. And um, if you don't want to go through all these hassles we went through in the last two years, you can just give the MW Collect Alliance a shot, which I've been talking before earlier because everyone is free to join. This is .org stuff, so if you need malware binaries or botnet information or whatever, feel free to approach us. And if you fulfill the requirement of being some trustworthy 
person or corporation you can just join as long as you guarantee not to share the data with any untrusted parties. That's not a big requirement, I said. Um, yeah, this is what we're seeing. So like, yeah, this is from this week again. So there's a lot of attacks and even more binaries we're seeing at times. So no, this is different scales, but uh, at some peak hours there's more than 300 binaries an hour. Yeah. Yeah, just go to that URL and it's all public data. You can just fit it there. Or ask us if you need any polished, specialized graphs or whatever. So, um, thanks to all the people that made this possible and also to those that, that gave us money for making this possible. Because as I've said, we're doing actually this all in our free time. We're students and any questions? Um, no, actually this is what we wanted to avoid. So we built this whole setup to avoid this, executing the actual client because um, we're using some this existing sandboxing and also researching some more static analysis stuff. We want to it, uh, exactly identify the protocol it is using and use then our custom tools to monitor the botnet because if you, you execute the client in some environment, first you, you run into hassles if you are carrying out an actual DDoS attack and you're IP is participating, well, you can still place firewalls around it and that's fine. But the second thing is we are, we are monitoring um, with this um, over a thousand botnets uh, constantly and it's getting more or less and it's going to be much more in the future. Um, not because there's going to be much more botnets, but we're not seeing all botnets right now. Um, and if you monitor these with, by executing them, you need a virtual machine for each of them. And I mean, if you pay us money for running 1,000 parallel hosts for money and monitoring them, that's fine. We're going to do it because it's the simplest for us. But we don't have money, so we have to be creative, and this is what we came up with. I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. Uh, the, the traffic itself, yeah, the, 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 the botnet traffic, you mean. Yeah, uh, we actually uh, have, have um, the client modules here that interpret the traffic, so they, they analyze it and then parse it for IC or HTTP, and the actual traffic payload, so the IC proof messages or whatever, is then stored in this database. As you can see, these are botnet commands and then stored in the database. That's it. Any other questions? All right, I said that's it then.